Welcome to the Plant Free MD Podcast with Dr. Anthony Chafee, where we discuss diet and nutrition and how this affects health and chronic disease, and show you how you can use this to optimize your health and happiness, both mentally and physically. Welcome, Ali Morgan, known as Ali Carnivore on Instagram. Um, yeah. Ali, we've been kind of messaging back and forth, and like you often repost our stuff, which is fantastic. And now I believe you're starting to post some of your own journey and your own experience with carnivore uh, and when we were messaging you mentioned um, that your son has autism uh, and that it has really improved uh, on a carnivore or carnivore-ish diet so um, I thought we'd get you on the pod with Anthony and I um, and we can talk about um, carnivore in general but also in the context of autism uh, so welcome Ali thank you it's great to talk to you guys Finally. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great to have you on. Um, you, you obviously, you know, we, we've interacted online uh, quite a bit and then uh, it was uh, great to see you in, in KetoCon. So Ali and I actually got um, to, to meet and hang out um, over at KetoCon and that's, um, you know, that's when uh, she sort of mentioned this stuff, which was really great. Uh, well, it's really exciting. You know, she just mentioned to me that, um, you know, that her, you know, it wasn't something that she spoke about much, but that when you know normally eating like a normal standard diet her son was a non-verbal autistic but then just getting rid of carbohydrates or even just going keto you know that that really changed can, can you tell us a bit about that yeah so um the um interesting thing is is that um you know, i had done carnivore years ago and then i had fallen off and i got really sick i i fell off when I was taking care of my grandmother. She had dementia. And then the last year of her life, she had cancer. Mm. Um, I ended up getting really sick and having to go back to carnivore to heal myself, which was a very interesting uh, process in had, itself. Had, Ali, Ali, what got you into carnivore initially? Because we're talking sort of like three or four years ago now, right? Um, yes. Um, well, what got me into carnivore um, initially um, Growing up, I had a variety um, of health problems, but I was always I was always lean and fit. I played sports, and I loved that. Um, after high school, of course, I wasn't playing sports, and I was uh, working, and, um, doing a few other things, and I started uh, putting on some weight. I was working in a food service area, and I ended up having an allergic reaction there. They had to take me over to the clinic. Um, where I had had a physical because you required a, a physical to work back in the food service. And they happened to mention that I was hypoglycemic because they had my chart. And that kind of freaked me out because I have a family history of heart disease, diabetes, all these things. Um, I actually have a congenital heart defect myself. And so it just kind of panicked me. Plus, I don't like needles and I was not interested in becoming a diabetic in any way, shape or form. Um, so how I got started, um, I knew my uncle had been on his own journey kind of thing. So I was like, I know this can be fixed. I know this can be reversed because what I knew about him was he had had a quadruple bypass and he had severe diabetes, but he was eating some sort of a diet where he had come off his insulin. Mm -hmm. And so I had to get in touch with him. And so he basically kind of stated that he was doing Atkins. So I was kind of looking around and I eventually found the Atkins book. I had read through that. Um, he suggested that um, I get a copy of Do Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solution. My dad ordered me a copy of that. I, I read through that. And my problem was, is that growing up, um, at 18 months old, I had developed viral gastroenteritis. And from there on out, I had irritable bowel syndrome. So all the things on the Atkins diet that kept you under 20 grams of carbohydrates were things that I had a lot of trouble digesting that irritated my digestive tract. I ended up contacting my uncle and I said, you know, is there something that I'm missing here that I could eat? that would keep me under the 20 grams of carbohydrates. And that's actually when he confided in me that if he went over 10 grams of carbohydrates, he had to use insulin. Wow. Yeah. So I was really shocked by that. So I was kind of 
what are you eating exactly? So he kind of ran through his day and I was like, okay, he's pretty much just eating meat. Mm. And now an interesting concept. Um, I had actually learned about the Inuits in elementary school. So I knew there were groups of people that just ate meat. And um, I had read something, I believe it was in the National Geographic and I had discussed it with my father and I knew about the Maasai. So I knew about some of these cultures that were, that were carnivores. So I was not afraid to just eat the meat by itself. Uh, the only thing that was in the back of my mind was a little bit was these people had done it for generations and they had done it since birth. Was there gonna be a little bit different reaction in me because I hadn't done it since birth, basically. But then that kind of all just went away when I started feeling all the positive benefits of it, which yeah. was incredible. So um, some of the things that I had, um, I was by the time I was eight years old, um, I had had uh, chronic sinus and ear infections. When I was four years old, I had to have full tonsils, adenoids, tubes mm -hmm. in the ears, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but by the time I was eight years old, I was having chronic migraines. Um, I had a form of epilepsy and I was diagnosed with uh, bipolar type one, dual swinging, rapid cycling. So I was heavily medicated. So thank goodness I could still play sports because that was kind of my outlet. So mm -hmm. I loved it. Um, I ended up actually an interesting thing. So I know I little something more about myself now because of the research that I've done, of course, and what you, what you hear now as well. When I was 14, I had an emergency appendectomy. And during the emergency appendectomy, the surgeon noticed something. And the next day when he came in to see me, he told me I had polycystic ovarian syndrome. Mm -hmm. And so I know that I was insulin resistant. And I think uh, obviously part of that, uh, we were following the guidelines. My dad was scared to death of heart disease and things like that. So we were using margarine instead of butter and all that fun stuff. It was low fat, all that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. the particular diet to treat the irritable bowel syndrome had quite a bit of carbohydrates in it. So what we were using at the time was uh, the row rotational diet. It was the elimination diet that uh, Dr. Albert Rowe invented. I think he published it somewhere around 1940. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what you did is you would eat the same thing for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you'd do that for four days in a row. And it was always basically a protein and a non-fibrous carbohydrate. So you would eat lamb and rice and you would eat that all day long. You wouldn't eat anything else. And you would do that for a minimum of four days. You could do it longer. And if you were okay and you didn't have symptoms, you could switch over to something like chicken and boiled potatoes that didn't have skin on them. So yeah. that's what it was. Yeah. It would have been great to have Dr. Salisbury's work. Just, just hey, just yeah. eat the meat. Would have been quick. That would have been sick because I probably would have never been diagnosed with anything else because I'm asymptomatic with everything else on carnivore. And I would have been carnivore yeah. yeah they were um obviously roe was too afraid to prescribe no vegetables so he's trying to give the kind of like you know what he thought was the least sort of yeah toxic carbohydrates right yeah and I, I think probably also he was probably looking for something that was a little less wow okay yeah take everything out can we have something <laughs> yeah yeah i i do appreciate that it was there because it was effective it did help. It did make you feel better, but mm. you know, ate a lot of carbohydrates because of it, because the simple carbohydrates, because they were just easy to digest mm. and they didn't interfere. I mean, it, it sounds like you're very sensitive to carbohydrates, like, like more so than perhaps the average person, because, you know, you had PCOS and hyperglycemia. Mm -hmm. Um, Anthony, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, yeah, definitely. You know, and like, um, uh, the you know the, the fact is is that, that there are some people that are very sensitive to carbohydrates. Your you know Ali clearly is, and you know you know. But then there's like there's tons of studies as well uh, that show like in, in autistic kids. I mean there's there's a paper 
that came out, you know, several years ago that talked about, you know, using a ketogenic diet as a treatment modality for autistic kids. So, you know, that's not, that's not unheard of, you know, so, I mean, those, that particular cohort is going to be very sensitive to carbohydrates because it you know, changes the energy dynamics in your brain um, mm-hmm. and, and every cell in your body, you know, including your brain. And so, you know, it, it it's, um, in the susceptible people that can make a dramatic difference. I mean, you know, people talk about, you know, they get, they lose the brain fog and they can think much more clearly. And that's, and that's people that don't, you know, aren't affected in, in such severe ways. It, so everyone gets a benefit from it and some people get uh, a massive benefit from it. Um, and, um, you know, but I, but also, you know, you're, you're just cutting down to like your meat and rice. You know, like it, it is going to be an improvement on a lot of other things, you know, because you're cutting out a lot of processed foods, you're cutting out a lot of sugar, you're cutting out a lot of plant poisons, you know, so you're, you're still eliminating yes. a ton of toxic material, it's just unfortunately, you know, they, they still left those, you know, poison ass grains and, and potatoes in there because, you know, those, ones, those ones, I think are, are probably the first things that really need to go, you know, I mean, obviously, I think fibers pretty bad for you as well. So at least it's easier to digest, but, um, you know, it's, yeah, I, uh, I learned that, um, my second time around, which is actually how I ended up going carnivore again, mm-hmm. because after, um, my grandmother passed, um, I had found a medical problem. Um, it was originally diagnosed as a pyelonidal cyst. Yeah. Okay. Now I had the first procedure it ruptured open about six weeks later. And then I went to see a different surgeon who, who my aunt knew, um, she's a nurse and he repeated the procedure and it ruptured open again. Now he was much different and much more efficient than the other one, because after a while he started asking me some very specific questions. And I finally told him, I said, look, I have irritable bowel syndrome. The past few years, I have had the worst flare I ever had in my life. So he said, okay, this is kind of interesting. I want to send you down the hallway to a colleague of mine that's a gastroenterologist. So I went down there. They did the endoscopy and the colonoscopy, and it found out that I actually had Crohn's disease. So what they realized, where it was, what they originally thought was a pyelonidal cyst was actually an exterior Crohn's fissure. Oh, wow. And that's why it wasn't healing. I literally was on bed rest with, for 18 months at this point. By the time this was, started to actually heal up, I was on bed rest for 18 months. This wound Jeez. was open, draining. It was horrible. And then mm. at this point, I was being pumped full of steroids. So I ended up getting bigger than I had ever been because I couldn't take care of myself. Other people were bringing me food. I was sick as a dog. Sometimes I didn't even want to eat because my stomach was so bad. I just didn't even want to put anything in it, but then other times I did. So I actually ended up at 265 pounds. Wow. And you, and, yeah. And and so, well, people can't see you, but you, I'm, you're, you're not exactly, you know, like a, a, a tall person, you know, no, I'm not like, <laughs> <Hogan>. <laughs> no, like, um, no, I, I, that's, um, that's, that would be a very difficult amount of weight to tell them. But I, I, are you totally, are you something like five, two or something like that? Five, three around there? No, I'm, I'm actually about five, four and a half, just under five, five. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So it's still a lot yeah, of weight to be totally. carrying on. Oh yeah. It's on a ton of weight. Five, it five was frame. huge. I, yeah. I've lost more than I weigh now. <laughs> I think, wow. I think my, my biggest weight uh, at six, three was like 270, 273, you know, mm-hmm. so you could, yeah. All right. So that's, that's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah. yeah good work. I, I remember, I remember my dad, he, he still, um, he was still pretty uh, bulky. He was a, he was a baseball pitcher, but he was at six, four, he was about, um, 236. And mm-hmm. so he's pretty good size. My uncle was like, the biggest guy I've ever seen in my life because he was <laughs> split nine and over 300 pounds and I was just nobody ever looked big to me <laughs> yeah yeah no kidding yeah he's a monster <laughs> he was he was huge yeah <clears throat> well and how how is your your Crohn's like a, a you know responded to all this because like you know mm-hmm. there, there's there's a ton of studies you know that um 
you know, I've spoken about like, you know, with like elemental diet, just like cutting out everything except like the core, you know, core nutrients uh, is, is one of the more effective uh, treatment tools is better than steroids. Um, mm -hmm. keep, you know, just even like a, a, like a fasting mimicking diet where you're not using any fibrous plants or anything like that. You know, it on average keeps people out of, uh, out of flare up for on an average of 51 weeks. And, uh, and they, and they trialed this against, you know, this was a controlled trial and people that, you know, were eating, you know, carbs and fibrous, uh, carbohydrates, uh, and they stayed in remission for an average of zero weeks. So it was a big, big, um, uh, contrast there. Uh, and I, I, and, you know, in my practice and the people I've spoken to, I've yet to see, you know, Crohn's or also colitis just not disappear fully on biopsy within three months. So how did it, how did that uh, help you? So I, I had gotten to the point when I had reached about the 18 month mark with this wound still open, I'm being pumped full of steroids. Hmm. I, I'm, I'm at the now where I was like, okay, when I weighed less than this, I was already hypoglycemic for all I know I'm diabetic at this point. And I was just frustrated. I'm like, something is going to kill me. I have an open wound that's been open for 18 months and yeah. you're talking possible infection here. And I'm like the diabetes concept. And I'm like, okay, steroids, Crohn's disease, this is miserable. So I was like, I have to find a solution. So I, I went online and I actually, um, ran across the IBS diet and it was uh, written by Heather Van Voros. And I started reading through it and she started talking about basically, if you have a digestive disorder, fiber is the enemy of the gut. Yeah. And she had this, this diet and I kind of downloaded the cheat sheet and I ended up getting a copy of the book and I started following the diet a little bit and I felt a little bit better. And then I kind of sat there one day when I was getting ready to try and get somebody to go to the grocery store for me. And I was looking at it and it was kind of very similar to Dr. Rowe's diet. And it was just kind of like, it's all like sugars and carbohydrates. And I'm like, okay, this, this is great for relaxing the digestive tract, but no offense to her. This is kind of a recipe for diabetes here. Okay. I can't do this. I'm like, okay. So no offense. What is, yeah. Right, yeah. So what, what doesn't, have fiber in it that I can eat. And I'm thinking, okay, the meat. So back to what I was doing. Yeah. And then um, the interesting thing was too, once I started doing that, the wound started closing up. I started healing. The wound started healing. Um, I was weaning off the steroids and everything. Um, about six months later, I went in for another colonoscopy and they didn't say a whole lot. And then they said, I want to do another follow-up just in case. And I was like, okay. So I went back for another one. And so I finally come into the office for, for the other one. And he sits down he looks at me and he says, you don't have Crohn's disease anymore. Nice. And he kind of had this weird look on his face. And I was like, well, that's great. And he goes, yeah, it really is. <laughs> I've never said that one before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's just because people just haven't come to the conclusion yet that it's not a disease. You know, it's your body reacting to specific stimuli and you remove that stimuli and it goes away. You know, that's what it's saying. It's like these are toxicities and, and toxins and poisonings. And then your body's responding to that poison and mm -hmm. that's the manifestation of that poison, you know, and mm -hmm. it's, and it's, and so if you approach it in that, with that mindset, that you remove the stimulus and, and the stimulation will go away. The medicine becomes a lot easier. And, um, yeah. and it's what, you know, I, I talk to people and, you know, I, I, I do consults and I talk about different things and it's just like, you know, everyone's sick. Everyone has diabetes. Everyone's got an autoimmune issue. Everyone's got this, that, and the other. And I'm talking about neurosurgical issues. And I just, I just can't keep my mouth shut. I'm like, you know, that all goes away if you just stop eating plants. Right. And they're like, wait, wait, really? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, seriously, like it just goes away. And, and, you know, we'll get into a conversation about it. And, and, you know, people talk about, it's like, oh, people just eat anything. They have no willpower. They, no, they, they are actually listening to, you know, people that really mean well, but have really incorrect information. And, and so you talk yeah. to them about it. And I, I was literally just talking to a guy yesterday and I was, I was a bit, you know, sort of miffed because uh, you know, the, like the acute medical unit was like insisting that I see this patient that clearly did not have any, any neurosurgical issues. 
And like they were telling me, it's like, oh, well, they got on the scan, they got this like L45 disc and like, and their legs just won't move at all. Well, it's clearly not that then because that only controls their ankles. So why the hell are you talking to me? You know, and like, and like, it's just, I could just tell that this was like a bullshit referral. And uh, like, it's just any way you slice it, but they were just calling me every single day. Like, oh, can you, you know, you have to come see this person. I'm like, fine, I will come see him. And, but, but I know this is going to be, you know, a waste of my time. I go in there. They're saying the guy couldn't move his legs. Guy, he's like paralyzed. He can't move his legs. Right. I go in there. Like he's sitting around pushing himself on the bed, like sitting around. I'm like, dude, guy can, cl he's clearly moving his legs, you know? <laughs> And like it just right in front of me, and they like tested him. Like he had no no neurological deficit. He was just in a lot of pain, and he had a lot of back pain, uh, which is not something that that surgery uh, really can help, and except in like very very few circumstances. And but he was diabetic, and he had um, other conditions. Uh, you know, and had you know he was heavy, and. And I just sort of just talked to him and, and you know, everything they give you in the hospital is just sugary carbs. And so I was just like, you know, this, all this stuff goes away. If you just don't eat this crap, right. It just goes away, you know? And he's just like, Jesus, like, are you serious? Like, he's like I would, I would love to stop taking this medication. I would love to stop doing this. And, you know, people think it's like, well, it's really hard to get people to change their diet. Like, I don't think you have actually tried ever, you know, because, you know, you know, these people take so many medications they 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 suffer, with the conditions that they have on the medications that they have. And they, they were looking for any solution to stop taking medication. They think that these chronic pain people, oh, they're just, they're just drug seeking. I was talking to this guy. He's like, I would do anything to get off these painkillers. You know, I was just like, you know, getting rid of this inflammation and, uh, and all the, this crap that you eat, you know, that will significantly help your pain and it will get rid of your diabetes or at least significantly improve it. And, um, and he was just like, I've, I've got to check this out. You know, please, you know, tell me more, where can I read about this? Where can I go about this? Uh, go to look about this, you know? So I, it, it was so easy. It's just like, just a mention of it. It was instantly like perked up. Like, are you, wait, are you serious? Like I can stop taking these damn drugs. Like I would, I would do anything for that. And, um, you know, so it's, it makes a huge difference. Um, and it's, and it's actually really easy. And so I, I, I just see these people all the time because everyone's sick now, everyone's over overweight or a lot of people are overweight and, and a lot of people have these comorbidities that, that can be just, they just, they just go away, you know, uh, if you just remove these stimulus, um, I was going to say, you know, they said, uh, that lady, I, you know, I can't recall her name, but she said that, you know, if you have a, um, a digestive issue, then fiber is your enemy. I, I would just, I would just expand that to like, you know, it's, it's everyone's enemy, you know, and just some people it's worse than others. And, um, you know, this is why, you know, in, in general surgery, you know, it's a, like a low residue diet, which is exactly what this, this person recommends, just basically a low fiber diet, but obviously you have to still eat carbs and whatever, um, that that helps rest the gut you know when you have surgery or have an infection or you do something you just you're trying to have less residue come through the large intestine because you're trying to uh let it just calm down and heal uh that that's that's what they use and then as, as soon as you're done they're like oh yeah, yeah make sure you get a whole bunch of fiber in you and then you, you just start the whole process over again it's just screw yourself um and uh, I just, I've always thought that was just so strange. Mm -hmm. Like even, even when I was just in medical school, I was just like, that doesn't make sense. You know, like why, why are we telling people that fiber, how can fiber be good for us? If, if we're telling people not to eat it, you know, when they're actually, when they actually have an issue, you know, is that, is that really helping them? You know, because it's causing stress in this circumstance. Is it just, is it, does it do the opposite on other, other circumstances? I don't know why it would you know, but that's what they say. And, um, you know, like, like you're saying, you're on these steroids and all these you know, people don't people think, or some people suggest that, you know, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, which have dramatically increased in, in number of people suffering from these things since the 1980s, you know, they say that, um, well, they probably were, had, we probably had you know, a whole bunch of other people probably didn't actually increase at all it's just that, you know, now we're just, we're just noticing it more and we're just, you know, documenting it more. It's like, you clearly never seen a patient with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Mm. You know, they, they require massive, heavy, you know, damaging drugs to, uh, to just, just deal with, you know? And so like that, like that, that's not something you just miss, 
You know, if you're having bloody diarrhea 20 times a day, I think you're going to notice, you know, and so, and, and horrible, horrible, excruciating pain. And like you say, you know, fistula and, um, and other, other, you know, side, you know, uh, consequences of this inflammatory pattern. So it's just really doesn't make any sense. Um, I was actually going to just jump back to you. You said you were, you were dealing with some mental health issues as well. There was, yes. um, yeah, there was a, a paper that just came out recently by, by Georgia Ede, who showed that it was like 31 patients who were refractory to medication, psychiatric patients who were refractory to medication. Um, so, so they had, they were on all the meds and it, and it still didn't work. So schizoaffective disorder, uh, bipolar, uh, major depression, and, you know, I think a few others. And so these people weren't helped with the medication, the maximum medications, and they still had this severe problem. And I said, okay, why don't we try a diet and just put them on a keto diet, not even a full carnivore diet. They all improved, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. and some of them were like just completely resolved their issues. You know, I mean, that, that just speaks to like the power of, uh, you know, not poisoning your brain with just carbohydrates, you know, it's just like, that's, that's a, a dramatic, dramatic difference. You know, when we look at these things, it's just like energy sources, but they do so much more in our body. These are complex biochemicals that have an effect on our body and our brain. And, you know, even just that energy dynamic is clearly enough to change how our brain functions at a primary level. Um, what were you, what, what were your experiences with that? How did that, um, you know, affect your, your psych, you know, your, your conditions? Yeah, I, I was fascinated. I, I was feeling a lot better when I first started basically Atkins, mm -hmm. but there was a dramatic shift when I went carnivore. That's when everything just kind of like fell into place. I got the, uh, the zero carbs in thing and i was just neutral at that point um i had been on a sleep aid a stabilizer and antidepressant and stuff like that and really one of the first things that i noticed is i was sleeping better through the night but then i was tired during the day so i approached the doctor and i'm like okay let me tell you i changed my diet and he you could see that i had lost weight and i explained that problem to him and he said well you know, you're eating better. Maybe you're sleeping better. Let's try yanking the sleep aid out. So I did. And, and I was fine with that. And then slowly mm. we just started reducing things. And when I fell off the diet, I had to go back on my medication. Mm. That was yeah. one thing new. And so I kind of really just kind of started researching, you know, why this would work, how this would work. And I ended up finding all kinds of info, um, you know, different pieces of information that even um, uh, nutritional deficiencies can mimic disorders, um, things like that. And it was just wild what I was finding. And I was like, okay, well, you know, carnivore provides you with all the nutrition. I didn't know what to call it then. <laughs> I was just like, I'm doing some kind of weird version of Atkins. That's mm -hmm. what I knew. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I actually didn't know it was called carnivore. Um, mm -hmm. I was following all these keto doctors and thankfully I was following Dr. Ken Berry. And then oh, he, I was in the video when he said, I'm going to try a carnivore challenge. I'm going to mm -hmm. try carnivore. What, what is he doing? And then he yeah. starts describing it. And I'm like, wait a minute, there's other people actually doing this besides, you know, that are actually in civilized places. <laughs> and that's how I actually found my first carnivore group because I started scrolling through the comments and who's now my friend, Marcy Lilly had posted, Hey, come join our, you know, our friendly carnivore group, zero carb, living the good life. And I clicked over and there was almost 600 people already in there. And I kind of had this epiphany. It's like, Oh my gosh, I found my people. <laughs> yeah, right. I think it was um, really fun. I think there's like 10,000 uh, now. <laughs> 10,000. Well, yeah, definitely Atkins or zero carb is a, a less triggering way of describing only eating meat for some people. You know, I think as soon as they hear carnivore, they're like, no, we are now, now I kind of just say it's kind of like a extreme keto because people understand that. Yeah. Too. People get keto, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a natural progression. You know, I mean, that, that's, that was the thing. It was, it was my first time at keto con, but you know, obviously the concept is there that there are some things that we eat that should be eliminated and you should, I mean, everyone, everyone's already sort of thought that as well, you know, like with, you know, don't eat, don't eat cholesterol, don't eat fat, don't eat uh, meat. 
um, they just got it wrong, you know, but the, you know, so the concept is it was already there. And then they, with keto, they just say, okay, carbohydrates that cause problem and they, and it, they do, but then it's sort of a, you know, a, a natural progression when you start recognizing that there are other toxic things in plants, uh, which, you know, um, I learned about obviously mm-hmm. know, 20, 20 plus years ago. And then, you know, in seventh grade and things like that, but, you know, hadn't really been spoken about. I remember I, I you know, um, sort of mentioned my, experience with that. And that's why I stopped eating any plants at all, you know, you know, back in college, uh, because, you know, I learned about how toxic that was, but, you know, that wasn't something that people really knew about. I remember when I, when I spoke with Dr. Baker about it on his first podcast, one of his early, early ones on the human performance outliers podcast, it was like episode 34 with him, him and, uh, Zach Bitter, who also met again in person in at keto Com, which was great to actually see him in person. He's a cool guy. Um, yeah you know, I sort of was, was talking about my experiences with that. And I remember uh, being on some of these carnivore groups, like zero, uh, zeroing in on health and, um, and zero carb health. And, um, and like Dana, uh, Dana Shoot said, uh, you know, sort of posted my interview and she's like, wow, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize this, that like, like plants actually are harmful and they have toxins in them. And like, this makes sense, you know, because, you know, we all feel better when we don't eat them. Um, and so when that started, you know, disseminating around with the keto groups, this concept that, you know, there's more than, you know, more than one bad thing in plants, you know, besides carbohydrates, it's, it's a natural progression to start, you know, getting those things off too, and weaning off more and more plants until you finally get to, you know, people call it the ultimate elimination diet. I just call it not eating poison, you know, of carnivore. And, um, and then you can, you just describe it like that as well. You know, when I, when I talk to people about it now, I just be like, well, you know, I just eat meat you know, like, oh, really just eat meat. And I was like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, humans are carnivores, you know, like that's the kind of animal we are. Mm-hmm. Every single one just goes, yeah, yeah, no, no, that's true. Like, this is not a, like a, a, a mystery. Like, this is what I was taught as a kid that humans were apex predators, top of the food chain. You know, that means carnivore. You know, that means super carnivore, you know, because you're eating other carnivores, mm-hmm. you know, as well as herbivores. And so, you know, it, um, when you, when you frame it in, in a certain way, it makes sense. And you sort of bypass all the, the dogma and indoctrination and people just go, Oh yeah, that makes sense. You know? And, um, so I think that, that hopefully we can keep sort of pushing out through like the keto community as well. And, uh, and have that, you know, sort of, sort of grow. And then, and then other people sort of take on from there. For sure. Um, Hey Ali, can we talk about your son? Sure. Um, so uh, Anthony sort of mentioned in, in a bit of an intro um, that he was a nonverbal um, autistic or he had autism and he was nonverbal. How's he, uh, how's he going now? Oh, he's, he's great. Um, he's very verbal. He's very vocal. Um, he goes to public school. Um, I do have him in uh, physical therapy because he's a toe walker. So we're working on, um, fixing that and he's got a little bit of occupational therapy but he's not in any kind of uh, special education I originally started out homeschooling and kind of enrolled them in like the third quarter of this past year just to get him some social interaction and everybody was going back so it's like he wouldn't be just completely brand new everybody else was just kind of getting back to things after the lockdown Mm. and um he had a good time. He fit right in. It was great. You know, he made friends and he had a good time. Yeah. And then, and then what happens when he eats carbohydrates? Um, uh, he has some, I'm not completely, uh, restrictive. I was initially, um, what had actually happened was because of the way I was eating, I didn't have any seed oils or anything in the house. So I was kind of cooking basically the way I would describe the way that we were eating in the house would have been the standard American diet from over a hundred years ago. I love that. Okay. So, yeah. So Very different to today. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I've always been a scratch cook. I got that from my grandmother. So I, I didn't buy Bisquick or frozen biscuits. I made biscuits from scratch and they had real butter in them with whole milk, that kind of thing. Lactose free, of course, because we have a little problem with lactose. <laughs> no surprise. Um, but that's what they were eating in my house. And he was 
kind of basically like a high functioning autistic. You could see that where the problems were and it was a little concerning. And I was like, okay, there's obviously some things that we could work through. He's probably going to need some sort of types of therapy and probably special education and stuff like this. What actually happened was I got into that carnivore group and they decided to have a meetup. And I drove out of state because where the meetup was, was an hour and a half from where my grandmother grew up and all my cousins were there. And um, so I was able to go down and visit my cousins. Literally, I have tons of them. My grandmother was one of 18 children. Okay. Wow. So I have, I, I don't even know how many cousins I have down there. They like populate the <laughs> yeah, half the state. So, yeah. so, yeah, so it was a lot of fun to go down there. And actually, um, she knew Kelly Hogan. Kelly came to the meetup. So that was a lot of fun to, to chat with her because we had been basically the exact same weight at one point. <laughs> and oh, so we were exchanging <laughs> kind of how we got started. And that, that was kind of fun. Um, but what happened was I left him and my daughter, she's 16 months older than him at my parents' house. I had to take the youngest with me because he was only 20 months old and he was still nursing. So he had to go <laughs> with mm -hmm. me. And of course, my parents weren't eating the things I was because my father was still in that, uh, okay, you know, saturated fat is bad. I'm terrified. He's, he's terrified. My grandfather died of a massive heart attack at 59. I never met him because he died a year before I was born kind of thing. And then he was concerned about the diabetes. So it was always like low fat, you know, and he was, had the, like this fiber obsession. It's like, oh boy but um I was I was telling Simon just a little bit ago he he I jokingly call him the waffle king that was something he always loved to do he loved to make pancakes and waffles and he got the Belgian waffle maker and he would like literally make that for my kids every morning that they were there so so what they were eating at my parents house for these like 10 days or so that they were there was today's standard American diet now my mm. mom was trying not to bother me while I was on this trip so I get back and he's like melting down in the living room. He's, he's whining incoherently. I have to kind of sit him down and put his shoes on. I couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. I'm thinking maybe he's just upset because mm. he's now got to leave grandpa and grandma, you know, because <laughs> yeah. he's crazy about my parents. Luckily, I'm just down the road from my parents. So it wasn't a long trip. So I get him in the house. And he kind of falls back over on the floor and I'm taking his shoes off and stuff. And then it got kind of excited because everybody's home at the house. And then he starts kind of rocking like this and he's putting his hand over his head and he's still grunting. So he's covering his ears and I'm looking at him and I kind of roll him over and his eyes are literally like this. I'm talking to him. I'm calling his name and he's not responding. I get him to sit up and he just starts going like this. Yeah. He had completely shut down. Mm, terrible. And then he started doing this with his head again and rocking. He smacked his head on the floor. And that's when I was like, okay, everybody's got to get out of the room. I knew he was overstimulated. It was too loud. I had to get him to settle down. Mm. So at this point, I'm realizing it's like, okay. It's kind of like what you had talked about before. I'm like, Okay, I need like a 20 minute meltdown, but I'm realizing even though what I was feeding him wasn't perfect, he was verbal. I could talk mm -hmm. to him. Yes, he had problems, but eating the natural fats, eating the animal protein, even with some you know, white flour and some sugar in his diet, he could talk to me. Eating the standard American diet of today, he can't function at all. There's no functioning with him. And that was kind of a big hit. It's like, okay, I was doing something right, at least. So I knew I had to get a hold of the doctor. And I was my first thought was, you know, I've got to just strip everything out. I've just got to take him carnivore to get him back. I've yeah. got to bring him back. It took about almost three days before we started seeing any improvement in him. Mm. And then it took a little longer and then he just took off. Great. And 
Exactly. And it was crazy. Things that we were told would be delayed started happening. It's like 27 days on the diet. He decided to potty train himself. They were telling us he, you know, six would be an appropriate age. He had just turned four. Mm -hmm. Just did it himself. And then he taught himself how to read. Wow. (laughs) It was crazy. (laughs) And he's still, um, he's still very gifted. Like I said, I was homeschooling initially. And uh, in order to homeschool, you have to submit the standardized testing basically to prove that but you're actually educating your children. So yeah. you have to submit that to the county. So I did the test at the end. Um, I actually had him in the same grade as my daughter. So he was in first grade last year and second grade this year. But when I enrolled him in public school, I went ahead and put him in first grade. So he would be with appears his age. I didn't want to push him too far initially even because they said there was no, pro- there's no problem. If, you know, if he gets bored, we can move him up. Not a big deal. But when I, we did the testing because he had to be tested, he was testing into the sixth grade level on a number of things. Wow. And sixth grade. I know that common with autistic children. If you can bring them out there, they're, a lot of them are very, very intelligent children mm-hmm. wow. and stuff. So he's, he's very yeah. gifted. And, um, part of that is also why I allowed things back in the diet. Because I could see that he was noticing that he was different. And the last thing that I wanted to do was be this like over restrictive mom that, okay, he's going to walk the chalk line, follow the directions until he's 18. Then he's going to graduate from high school or whatever, move out or go off to college. And he's going to go, okay, let me have some stuff. And then he shuts back down. Yeah. Because when he does get a hold of too much, you can start seeing the regression. And so to me, if he were to do that, the only way that I would know is if he was living with somebody and they called me, or I end up getting a call from either an emergency room or a psychiatric hospital, depending on where somebody hauled him off to. Yeah. And I didn't want him to go through that. So I wanted him to learn why he's eating the way he is. And he is. Because he does get to the point where he'll start to progress some, and then we'll sit down and we'll talk about what he eats. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, I don't ever want to eat that again. That food's bad. Yeah. So he's getting, but I think he's going to need just to be just a little bit older. Cause trust me, I'd love them all to be full carnivore. Yeah. That would be great. And I know, you know, he was like me. I knew what I felt like when I was at my peak. When I was younger, and then when I'd go down, I'd hate it because I knew what I was capable of before, and it just pissed me off that I was not able to do what I know I can do. And so, what I figured I'd probably end up doing is when he's a little bit older, I don't know, maybe around 10, 11, or whatever, I'd I'd probably want to wait till the summer, do like a carnivore challenge with him, and -hmm. just do it for, for 30 days. And then if he goes off, and he kind of has the crash, which I figured he would. I just don't want it to happen while he's in school and then have him melting down at school. And I, I'm not what I was. Mm. And yeah. feeling that, effect. but I, I That's, know the more he, the more carnivore he is, the better he is. That must be Absolutely. a really tricky balance though. You know, like as, as you say, you don't want to kind of force it and you don't want to wrap him in bubble wrap and have him never experience not being on carnivore and never experienced the carbohydrates because it's kind of like every time he chooses to take that little bit of poison or a bit of toxicity it's it's that reminder of or teaching him that it's not good for him so yeah yeah, yeah. If, if they didn't have if none of my children had this problem i just go like hardcore and it's like okay you can choose what you want to do when you move out but the fact that he could literally collapse and and not function anymore if he did that, no. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, so how, how, does it, how does that work with like school lunches and, uh, and things like that? He's back sort of doing, you know, in, in school and, and interacting with other kids. Is that, is that an issue? Do you send him to school with, with your own lunches? Like how do, how do you navigate that? Well, actually, uh, apparently you have to have snacks and all kinds of stuff. 
They don't do that at home. You know, they eat breakfast. Sometimes we remember to eat lunch and then we eat dinner. They're, they're not hungry mm. because they use large quantities of food and then they eat large quantities of food here because they're not hungry. But at school, it's like they have to have a snack and then they have to have lunch. So usually what I do is I pack the snack as kind of pretty much a carnivore snack. Mm. And then he doesn't really want much of the lunch right now because of things that are happening. The elementary school is actually providing the lunches for free. And then he doesn't really eat the lunch because he's filled up on the snack that was really healthy. So he doesn't really get much. Yeah. And then when he comes home, we just eat. And sometimes I have a little extra something for him with dinner. Sometimes it's like, here's the roast, have a nice day. And they just eat it, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Or one of his favorites is chicken, but now he's really starting to like beef a lot more. Oh, nice. Yeah. So it, it's really funny because sometimes I, 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 I add a little bit of seasoning to theirs to make like a broth if I cook a roast or something like that. And I don't like to over salt it. So I just cook it plain because I don't use a whole lot of salt. I don't even put salt on it. And we were all literally standing there in the kitchen, just eating it with no salt. <laughs> there was nothing on it. It was hysterical. Yeah. Is, is, do you have, do you have video? I didn't ask you that, but like, is it, um, you were just sort of describing, is it on? sorry. Is it not on? I was, no, it's not on. I, yeah. I that was intentional. On? Yeah. Well, do? Yeah. Well, that, that's what I was saying. You were saying that he was, you, you were sort of going through some motions that he was doing. And I was just like, I was like, I can't there see. Yeah. It's on now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's what it. Am I in the ceiling? <laughs> Where am I? No, you're see, somewhat I'm in the middle. You, you're a little bit high up. Can you not see yourself? I'm trying. This is like, <laughs> thank goodness it was Brett. I, I did the Instagram line with Brett. He was walking me through the whole thing. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. This well, is just working. crazy. And the sound, the sound but, is pretty good too. Fantastic. But that's oh, Brett. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. Hey. Because <laughs> I yeah. thought I saw myself on the screen with, with Simon. And then I was like, what happened? Okay. I don't know. Yeah. Whatever. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah well that's good so uh, so what how old is he now he's seven now okay all right and yeah. uh and then yeah and then reading or, or or doing certain things at a sixth grade level like that's um you yeah, know for that's unbelievable seriously not americans you know that's sort of like an 11 year old sort of level 11 to 12 year old level mm. you know so that's fantastic I, I was like that and my dad was too yeah. So it actually, that was really crazy because I was in special education, obviously, because I had the bipolar disorder. So I was an EDLD. And because I was the same way, it actually prevented me from getting diagnosed with my learning disability because nobody mm. believed me. <laughs> uh, okay. I didn't get diagnosed with my learning disability until like 10 years after I graduated from high school. Oh, wow. It was ridiculous. I was so mad, but I was so happy when I finally found somebody that I was describing it to. And they were like, do you know what you have? And I was like, I don't know. No. And then they told me and I'm like, and they showed me the list. And I was like, are you kidding me? I have a special education teachers in these specialists and they couldn't figure out that this is exactly what I was explaining to them. What yeah. is this? Well, Ali, can you, just, can you just explain it a little bit more to me? Is it like you you had a learning disorder, but you didn't know that you did because you were functioning at um, like a few grades above your age? It wasn't track? just a few grades above. It was right. majorly because I was complaining so bad. They actually did a series of testing on me in the ninth grade. I didn't actually get to finish this test because I was taking so long on it. The lady came over and looked at where I was and stopped me where I was. I would have loved to have known where I was able to go, but she stopped me at grade 18.4. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah. So 12.9, of course, is you're the equivalent of somebody who's graduated from high school. And then you add, you know, 13.1 is one year of college. So 18.4 is. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. yeah. So they were like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mm. I was mad. If yeah. I had known that why they were testing me, I would have just <laughs> fail it. Yeah, yeah. Help. Yeah. So, I, sorry, if, if you don't mind, um, what what sort of learning uh, issue did you have? I have dysgraphia. 
Okay. Which is? Dysgraphia is, it's a um, fine motor coordination defect where the brain and the fingertips don't connect with words, basically. So you have trouble writing. Okay. You have trouble putting the, the words on paper. Um, some of the symptoms are you're, you're trying to write, um, you miss words, um, your hand will cramp up. It's very painful. So, and, and it was incredibly frustrating to me because I couldn't write things like essays and stuff like that. Mm. And I was sitting there and I would complain to my teacher. I'm like, look, I can dictate this to you all day long, <laughs> but I just I can't make it come out oh, on the man. paper. You know what? I think, a lot was, of, I think a lot of people struggle with stuff like that. Like obviously yours is very cute, but like, you know, writing these long right. form essays, handwritten, you know, that's only going to suit a small percentage of students, I think. Um, yeah, and mine actually, um, some people did well with typing. Mine actually crossed over into typing. I had trouble typing. Yeah. I was like, frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it was frustrating, but um, some things that uh, I could get typed up. My mom could type it up. My mom can type really fast. She was actually um, a secretary for the interior department. She could, I forget how many words a minute she used to be able to type. Yeah, a lot, lot more than <laughs> me, I'm sure. Yeah, so I could just dictate it to her and she'd type it yeah. up. And I'm like, okay, here you go. <laughs> no, There's your cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was like a voice to text where I use voice to text all the damn time. Like that's yeah. just like, yeah. if I had had that, that would have been great. It would have been yeah. perfect. Yeah. But they didn't have it yet. And now they have that. And that that was actually, if I remember correctly, I remember when that first came out and they were gearing it towards people that had learning disabilities. And I was like, Bastards. Yeah. <laughs> what can we do before? Graduated. Yeah. I could have done in college. Yeah. So how, how old was your son when you sort of figured all this stuff out? Uh, when you first went to that first meetup and you saw that that big, big change uh in him? Um, I was getting he was getting ready to turn four. Okay. He was about a month from turning four. All right. It, and so, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say like, and so, so he's had a, a, a few years now of eating a better diet and yes. uh, able to sort of develop better. Have you seen like a, like a difference in his, his trajectory of development as well, since you sort of made these, these, uh, dietary changes? Yes, he, he's definitely, um, increased on the growth chart mm -hmm. as well as far as height. Oh, and okay. So, yeah. Yeah. That's because he was in a really low percentile. Yeah. And, and I figured that was just kind of norm. At all, all of my children have because everybody eats this way. You know, the whole, whole family does. But I thought it was kind of normal because their dad was never on the growth chart. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very long story, but his, they yeah. didn't beat him. Oh, his, his brother's like half a foot taller than him okay wow. well it's like no. I, yeah my brother did that to himself you know like he just he's just a picky little eater and so like he just wanted to eat white rice and tempura sauce so it was like sugary carbs and, <laughs> and soy and um you know he just he just you know he would eat some other stuff sometimes but he would that was that's what he wanted all the time and it was just it was a carb and sugar addiction and unfortunately my mom you know, he was the baby. So she just sort of given up at that point on, on trying to make him do anything. If it was, if it was one of us, you've just been like, that's, yeah, you're not getting away with that. Um, you know, but with him, you know, she made a lot of concessions and he's like, well, I, I have to get him to eat something. I, he has to eat something. I was like, he doesn't have to eat crap. You know, like he needs to eat actual food. And I mean, I was like, I was, you know, 10 or 11 telling, trying to admonish my mom. I was like, no, he needs to eat real food, not just eat anything. You know, that's not this, it's not the same thing. And, you know, he's, um, I think he's like 5'10", 5'11", mm -hmm. at, at the, at the most he's 5'11". Mm -hmm. I think he's under 5'11", 5'11", though. He's like 5'10", something. I'm 6'3", my brother's 6'4". You know, right. and, we, and we ate a standard American diet just without a lot of sugar. We never had sugar in the house, mm. you know, and, and um, yeah. one of the interesting uh, things, both um, my brother and I both had to be treated with this diet because we both got very sick. He ended up um, having the exact same problem that I did, but um, his was actually earlier on and the gastroenterologist 
told my parents, they, they said, look, uh, this, this is going to pro this is going to cause some, um, problems with nutrition and they're not going to be as tall as they should be. And especially when he was looking at my dad and kind of like, I'm sorry, <laughs> your son's not going to be as tall as you kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, like, you know, getting more like an actual diet. He was up with my parents. It's like, look, they're just not going to get the level of nutrition that they, that they need to grow properly. Mm. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you know, hopefully now, you know, though, I mean, like you say, you know, they, they, they've increased on the growth chart already, mm -hmm. you know, so, you know, they've got a lot of developing to do with brains and bodies. So, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of room to catch up, you know, and, um, you know, I, I, I unfortunately came across this when I was already, you know, fully, fully developed and well, yeah. And, um, and so that, that, that sort of pissed me off because like, I didn't get to grow, uh, uh, you know, with, uh, with, uh, with that sort of level of, of nutrition, but, um, you know, your kids still have like a ton of time to grow, yeah. you know, so that, that's great. I, you know, I'd be excited to see, you know, just how much more they go just because, you know, they have, they have a ton of time, you know, you, you could say you, your, your son's been doing this since he was four. That's a lot. That's a lot better than a lot of people get. And so even though he had a bit of a rough start, you know, he may very well end up, you know, well above the curve. Uh, you know, if he, he keeps this up, which it sounds like, you know, he's developing that, that sense of why he's doing this and, and that, uh, that aversion to these things, because he can see very clearly the direct result of eating poison, you know, <laughs> and he's, and he has a, a very clear difference, you know, which yeah. is, actually, you know, be very, very beneficial to him, you know, down the road. Yeah. We, we, we've had, um, my, um, my primary care is actually a friend of mine and she's kind of jokingly kind of predicted where he's going to be. He's like, well, if he takes after your side of the family, it's going to be interesting because all the men on my side of the family, they go through this growth spurt where they grow about seven to eight inches in one year, <laughs> just nice. before they yeah. stop. And she said, that's not normal. That doesn't normally happen. So if they don't do it, probably be about here but if they do it this is where we're going <laughs> I'm like, yeah. okay i just don't want to feed them then <laughs> yeah yeah they can like, get, get job yeah yeah it's like you kids are gonna have to work for your meat <laughs> i know i'm like at least i have friends that own a cattle farm I'm that's like, the way oh to do God. it you even need a cow in the backyard it, it's gonna be kind of funny at some point though i have a feeling it's like i need another half cow you bought one last week. I know, but they already ate it. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but they you just went through a growth spurt. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. We need two. Yeah. The, and, and people are shocked sometimes when I talk about the amount that they can eat. Because um my youngest was basically he's just been carnivore and he loves it. He will eat meat over anything else. And he actually threw a temper tantrum at my mother's house. Well, because she was trying to help everybody was tired that weekend and she had taken these pre-made meatballs and she put them in sauce and all kinds of stuff and he he won't eat spaghetti he won't eat anything like that he hates noodles and stuff like that and he got mad and i had left some steaks there <laughs> that i was gonna i had to end up cooking him a steak and my yeah. mom was just this is just he won't why he won't, kids love spaghetti they love meatballs and i'm like no <laughs> not this one yeah. you put sauce on he's not going to eat it <laughs> you put noodles near it he's not going to eat it it's just not yeah. happening but when they when i first transitioned him even it was just amazing because he wasn't even two years old and so i had basically i had a five-year-old a four-year-old and a not quite two-year-old and i could cook two pounds of sausage in the morning and they would devour it the three of them and yeah. so they were eating about three quarter pound a piece at each meal. <laughs> yeah, they were eating more than awesome. blood. <laughs> yeah, well, that's awesome. And my, my youngest one, he he likes to gnaw the the bone because I I do that for like ribs and stuff like that, like pork spare ribs. If I eat that, and they actually, we have two um, barbecue places that are family owned barbecue places in the area, and they nicknamed him the Bone Crusher. Because they just got the biggest kick out of him because he wasn't even two years old. He's, very, he's 
gnawing through the bone to eat the marrow out of it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Like, okay, um, just go. Bud. Yeah. Well, Allie, um, thank you so much um, for coming on and tell us your story and, uh, and telling us about your son. It was, it was a very personal, um, mm -hmm. you know, thing. And it's not, not something that, that uh, everyone likes to share mm -hmm. with a wider audience. But, but it's important. Uh, very important. And I, and I really appreciate it because I think there's a, there are a lot of people out, out here that um, maybe they are interested in a carnivore diet or not. But, you know, they think that like this isn't manageable because I have kids and I can't get them to eat this, that and the other. But, you know, maybe and especially with aut autistic kids, sometimes they can be very, um, uh, you know, they, they don't want to if they don't want to do a certain thing, like maybe they don't want to eat meat or they want to eat these other things It can be very difficult to uh, you know, sort of bring them around um, mm -hmm. and it can, be, it can be quite hard. And so, uh, you know, having your story and having you, know, you tell us about how your son made this massive, massive turnaround in his health and his development, you know, that, that might, you know, help people with that and just be, okay, I've just got to figure this out. I've, I've, this, is, this is too important. My child's health and their development is just it's, because, you know, once you stop developing, that's pretty much it. You know, you can, you can sort of affect how your, your set mechanics operate, but you cannot develop again, you know? And so, it may be enough for them to say like, okay, well, this is too important. I can't, I have to get this before this becomes permanent. I have to, I have to do something before, uh, while they're still developing and while their, their brain still has a, a chance to catch up, um, and right. develop, you know, because that, that's what autism is really. It's, it's a misdevelopment of the neurons in your brain. And, you know, there's different reasons for that, but either mm -hmm. way, the neurons aren't actually, uh, developing normally and they so they don't don't work as normal and so they have they have differences in um their development in that way but also just the functionality as you say you know in three days you know what what he has already developed works entirely differently and now he's developing differently as well and so hopefully this will inspire people more to say okay no i've, I've really got to I've, I've just got to figure it out whatever I can do, I need to do this because this is, you know, my child's health and development is too important. So I thank you very, very much for sharing a very personal story. Yeah. And I, I was actually, um, I'm very excited. Um, we had, we had a different, um, primary care doctor, um, when I first did this and he, he treated, uh, the entire family. And so when he saw him and then, you know, I took him back after the dietary change and he's so what are you doing and so I kind of just explained it to him and I was a little nervous about it and then he he just kind of looked at me and he said I'd rather change his diet than medicating mm, smart yeah and I was you. oh my gosh I almost hugged him <laughs> yeah well it sounds like you actually had had some doctors who have brains you know yeah because and, um, like, not all of them get my, it my current uh, primary care doctor is actually a friend of mine mm -hmm. and she got tired of just treating yeah. uh, patients and having to follow these set of rules. So she left the practice that she was in to do her own practice. And now she's, it's holistic, a lot of holistic treatment, even though maybe she doesn't necessarily prescribe exactly what I'm doing. She thinks it's wonderful. And it's a totally different atmosphere to walk into her office than to walk into a regular doctor's office because you don't have these, uh, you know, notepads laying around or something, pharmaceutical companies. You walk in and there's like natural supplements and all this stuff. And, and here's, here's a massage clinic that you can go to. Here, here's um, another friend of mine that I know that's a lactation consultant. Here's her card. It's, it's nice. all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's completely different because it's like, this is natural care. She, you know, she still does, you know, if you need an antibiotic or something like that, that's great. But she tries to treat everybody who's willing to do it naturally. Yeah. Well, that's, I mean, and, and that's the thing, you know, it's just, it's, it's the difference between, you know, health optimization and disease management. You know, you're trying yeah. to, you're trying to get, actually get people healthy, not just mitigate you know, disease and damage, you know, and recognizing that these aren't diseases that you can actually, you know, get rid of them, 
by doing certain lifestyle changes. And, you know, you know, we've been influenced uh, for better or worse uh, by pharmaceutical companies. I mean, some of these things are, are, are actual miracle drugs. And, and so we've gone, like, wow, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Antibiotics, holy crap, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, then we've sort of said like every new drug is a good thing. Maybe a lot of them are, but, you know, we, we've, we've gone away from treating people and treating the person to now treating the disease and you've sort of lost sight of that. And now we're just, we're just trying to find a pill for something. Oh, you've got this problem. Oh, let's find a pill for it. Oh, there's enough people that have it. Oh, okay. You know, 13% of the population have this thing. Let's get a pill for that thing, you know, or maybe think about like, well, why do we have 13% of people having that thing when we used to have no one, no one had that thing. I mean, few people had that thing. Now it's just, oh, let's get a pill for that thing. Well, we didn't have, it's not, the problem isn't that people stopped taking the pill and they had the problem. The pill never existed. That disease never existed. So why the hell is 13% of people you know, have it now? Why the hell is 9% of people in America diabetic? Why the hell are 40% uh, pre-diabetic? You know, hundred years ago, that wasn't a thing, you know? And instead of asking the question of, okay, what the hell happened to change that? You know, they're just saying, well, oh, let's get some pills, you know? And so we've just changed our mindset on how we approach these diseases and, and these conditions as doctors. And, uh, and we need to change that. And so it's really good to see, you know, your friend has, has actually figured that out and is, mm -hmm. is taking a step back and being like, no, 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 this isn't, this isn't how you should do this, you know? Uh, so that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, and yeah. I never had a problem with it. Cause I was kind of always a, like an outside of the box kind of thinker. So all of this always kind of worked for me. Like I remember a conversation that I had with my dad because he was explaining why we did certain things and he was explaining, you know, trying to explain you know, his dad had a heart attack and there's diabetes. I was about six years old and I was like, so what is diabetes? I didn't even understand what it is. And so he's, how do I explain this to a six-year-old? And so he just kind of said, it's high blood sugar. Yeah. They have too much sugar in their blood. And I looked right at him and I said, well, why don't they just stop eating sugar? Like, yeah. yeah, this is cool. Yeah. And then I remember my mom Child's was wisdom. some way <laughs> went to this diet place and they gave her all this food and she came back with it. And I thought to myself, okay, what's wrong with our food that makes my mom gain weight, but this food is different. And so I was always questioning things and I drove an instructor nuts when, um, I went to college because I took this health and wellness course and he was asking about multivitamins. Why do we take a multivitamin? And, and I, I was actually the person that answered the question. I raised my hand and I said, in case we don't get everything that we need in our, our diet every day. And then it just hit me as soon as I said that. And I was like, when did they make multivitamins? They haven't had multivitamins forever. How did we survive as a species without multivitamins? What's wrong with our food? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's it. We're, we're, we're so I just aggravating him. He's like, whoa, too many questions. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're, the we're, the, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're the multivitamins for squirrels, you know? Right. I mean, how, how do they not, how do they survive without these supplements, these life saving supplements that everyone has to have because no one can possibly get, you know, full nutrition from their food? That's another, that's another concept that people, is, I, I was talking to a, you know, a vegan, um, uh, dietitian actually, she was finishing her, her PhD in, in uh, nutrition. And we had this big back and forth. I ended up actually converting her, but you know, that was, that was one of the things that, that got her was uh, the supplement thing. She's okay. So what supplements do you take? I'm like, I, I don't, yeah, it really took me back. That was the first time I, I that, that had, um, you know, sort of come up and I was like, I, I don't, it's like, no, of course you do. You have to, everyone, everyone takes supplements. I was like, no, no, they don't. Like I don't, I don't take any supplements. Why would you have to take supplements if you're eating what you're biologically adapted to what your, your, your species specific diet is like, why would, why would you need to, you shouldn't have to. And that all of a sudden hit her because she takes a buttload of supplements at the time. And so like, all of a sudden she's like, shit, that's right. You know, like, how can I say this is nutritious if you have to take a whole bunch of pills with it just to get basic nutrition, you know? So that doesn't, that doesn't pass, you know, that doesn't pass muster. So um, you know, it's, a uh, uh, it's a, it's a big one, you know, people say, Oh, everyone's taking, so, and your food is taking something You're giving B12 injections to cows and so you might as well just take it yourself. It's like, you don't get B12 injections to cows to eat grass, dipshit. You're only doing that to people that are, that are like sitting in grain feedlots for six months because they're not eating what they're supposed to eat either. 
You know, it's just like you have all these people going around giving B12 shots to like squirrels and field animals and things like that. Like, where are these, you know, benevolent, you know, field marshals that were, you know, going around just, just doing that? It's like, Jesus, I mean, what, how did these squirrels survive before you had all these forest rangers going around giving them B12 shots? That's amazing, you know, that we have this service for free. Vitamins you know? for squirrels. There's a business idea. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah it's like, it's that stupid. was like when the blood type diet started taking off again. I Somebody was recommending it to me and my, my first thought was I knew my grandmother had a completely different blood type than my mother and I was like how does that even make sense oh, the blood type diet. A- very confusing yeah I read yeah. a book on that and I can't that no sense. yeah and then one of my other first thoughts was okay <laughs> we're species do other species have blood types so I looked it up real quick and I and I was like by golly they do yeah. and my first thought was you don't have a pack of lions out in the wild and they take down like a zebra or something and then they stand around going like bob jill you know yeah. joe and i can eat the zebra because we have the a4 yeah. and you guys are you know d9 so you have to wait till we get a giraffe you know yeah. <laughs> they're no, lions yeah. well, just eat yeah, it. So, and, and that's the thing you know this, this is this is one protein that's that's different on red blood cells and that's it, you know? So it was like, what's, what's, how, how are you fundamentally changing your entire digestive tract based on <laughs> one protein on one cell line in your body? What the hell kind of sense does that make? You and know? It didn't make any sense to me. No, it doesn't make any damn sense, you know? But I think that, you know, maybe it's like, you know, you go into one of these things, oh, you should be eating this and you should be eating this. I didn't hear a blood type for, you know, processed crap. You know, you're the processed crap blood type, you know, so every single one is going to like a whole food approach. And so everyone, when compared to, uh, you know, processed crap approach, they all improve like, oh no, I did that. And I actually got better. It's like, well, yeah, of course you did because you got rid of things that were even worse, you know, yeah. but like I'm a positive. So I, I should be a, a bloody vegan. I'm like, don't think so. Yeah. You know, that's not going to work. And, I know I went through the whole list. So I just out of curiosity pulled up the, the list and I'm like, okay, if I eat like three quarters of this stuff, I'm going to be doubled over in pain with my stomach. This is not happening. Yeah, and this just uh, doesn't even look appetizing. I'm like tofu. Oh, no. I actually oh. ate tofu one time. I thought it was regular cheese on a platter. Yeah. <laughs> I think, that, oh, that was bad. <laughs> I was like, gross. I mean, it's a very, it's a very creative to- idea, but there's, there's no, there's no logic to it. Is that- what what is this and, and they were like it's, it's tofu cheese and i was like okay what else did you bring because i'm not getting near it <laughs> um yeah it was great yeah that was great thank you yeah thank you both it was great to great to chat with you guys